All right, y'all. All right, all right, all right. Good evening. Uh, welcome back. Um, the name is Dr. Shingema Vima, and I'm back with another video in this, our Intro to African History series. Now, we do several other videos, and I think the last couple of videos have been outside of the Intro to African History series, but it's mainly African history on this channel, and we have, uh, we've had our, our most consistent series has been the Intro to African History series. And this video will focus on East, Central, and Southern Africa in the 15th to 18th century, that sort of three, 400 year period. And of course, that's a very large amount of time to talk about such a large space. So I've picked a few distinct communities that I found interesting and that I think tie into other things we've spoken about already. Uh, so I'll be focusing on those. If you remember in the series, we started off with the transatlantic slave trade and went forward into the 19th century, 20th century, up until the advent of independence from colonialism. So if you can imagine that with this video, we are almost, after we did that, we went back in time and, and did a couple other videos that preceded that period. So one we've done, I think the most recent one we've done in the series was focusing on the East African coast, right? The, the, the coastal towns, Zanzibar, Kilwa, Sofia, Mombasa, and so forth. So that was our last video we did up to the 16th century. So if you can imagine this video being <clears throat> another video within that series, but we're almost going back in time and we are situating it somewhere on that timeline. And to help with that, in the description box, I will put some of the other videos we've already made that are chronologically subsequent to this video, if that makes sense. So videos of Southern Africa in the 19th century, I'll put in the description box, videos of uh, Central, uh, East and Central Africa to the, in the 19th century, I'll put in the box, because today we're focusing on the 15th to the 18th century. Um, finally, the song I was playing, you know, Nice Little Bob, uh, that was a song from one of my favorite artists, not, of, not just of the moment or of this generation, but arguably of all time, and his name is Ja Prazer. He's from Zimbabwe, and that song is named Mukwasha, and it's off of his uh, most recent album, Hokoyo. And as you, as you might have gotten accustomed to already, if I play a song uh, from a region, it means we're probably talking about that region today. So best believe that Zimbabwe, or at least early incarnations of Zimbabwe, We'll be, we'll be talking about that today. <clears throat> then one more disclaimer, or one more reminder that this is part of our intro to African history series. So the rigor really is really introductory, like, like I said. So in, in addition to those other links, I'll put in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the description, I'll also put links to some of my sources. So if you wanna go further, uh, deeper into these, uh, communities and spaces and, 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 and periods, you can do that yourself as well, okay? So this is introductory, at least this particular series is introductory. So uh, without further ado, allow me to share my screen here. And bueno, I think this is it, yeah. We are. Okay, there we go. All right, like I said, these are the communities we are talking about today and I will go right in. And I'll see you guys at the end as I do so. The first community I wanted to touch on that I thought was interesting was the Maasai people. Now the Maasai people, uh, today, uh, a prominent, albeit a minority group in both Kenya and Tanzania, where in Kenya, they make up maybe 1.8 million uh, people in the population, according to the census, and Kenya is just over 50 million people, so that's around, what, 4% of the nation, and in Tanzania, there are around 800,000 documented um, 
Maasai people today, and the population of uh, Tanzania is around 56 million. So that's around, what is that? 1.5, just under 2%, right? So, you know, they are small but mighty. They are, they are very visible, even though their numbers are dwindling. So this group, uh, the Maasai people are the last group of the Nilotic people to migrate uh, southeastern, uh, southeastwards from around the uh, parts of the Lower Nile River, which is to say around modern day Sudan, right? And they, and dates have them uh, migrating from there around um, the late, uh, the mid uh, 15th century. The mid 15th century, they, they, they migrate from there. Um, and, you know, they, they are the next in a series of other, of other groups that migrate as well from there, which include the likes of um, the Luo people, right? But what is outstanding about their migration, uh, the, the Kalenjin is another group that also migrated from there. And the, in, in those parts of, you know, where they migrate to Kenya and Tanzania, those parts are largely populated already by, by different Bantu people. Now, it is important to know that the Maasai are not, are not Bantu, right? Remember, the Bantu people um, are part of the Niger-Congo family, right? Particularly Niger Congo B, and um, and so 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 when they might so they and the migrations the Bantu migrations that began, uh, you know, in the before the Common Era, two thousand uh, BCE, and would go on until fifteen hundred CE. So they you know the 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 those places were already populated by Bantu people. So when the Nilotic people were migrating from what is now the, the Sudan area they were really coming into contact with these, with these groups, right? And the Maasai in particular made a, a, a remarkable, uh, their, their migration was, was remarkable for the, for the reason that they were very efficient in, in capturing uh, particularly grazing land. Why is this? Well, as the, as the, as the, as the heading here says, the Maasai are very specialized, specialized pastoralists. And you can say to me, well, you know, aren't a lot of people from around that time when they pretty efficient pastoralists? Yeah, but the Maasai take it to a whole new level, a whole new level, right? They are very, very um, efficient. And when, so what they will do is they would go across and not just seize the grazing land, but the, they would seize the cattle of all the other people that they were coming across, either whether the people were also Nilotic or whether they were Bantu people, right? Um, so, which really did not endear them, as you can imagine, to the, to the communities um, uh, that, that they were coming across. Because in, 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 in Maasai cosmology, the idea is that traditionally they believe that all the cattle in the world belong to them. So when they would seize these, uh, when they would seize the cattle from these other places, it wasn't in this sort of we are we are robbing you or anything like that. It was really within the spirit of these belong to us by divine right, right? So that did not necessarily uh, endear them to to. Um, uh, to other groups, but although they raided other cattle herding people and expelled them from their grazing lands, they still developed peaceable relationships with neighboring Bantu speaking farmers. Uh, for example, they would trade with the Kikuyu and the Kamba uh, for iron weapons and food. And it, there was even some level of intermarriage between the Maasai and Kikuyu, and the Kikuyu are a prominent group in contemporary Kenya, right? Um, the society of the Maasai was organized largely into three age sets uh, developed along military lines, children, young adults, and elders. And in the early teens, the boys were passed through a tough initiation process, which included military training. Um, their duty was to protect herds, 
as well as uh, to go raiding. So they would also serve as warriors. So in all this, the Maasai did not serve as, operate as one single coherent group. Um, the, you know, they were a collection, sort of a federation of various related groups that were governed by councils of elders. And to this day, like I said, they are still very visible. Some of the things that they are known for, of course, is, their, is, their, is the importance of, the continued importance of cattle to their, to their society. Um, I was also finding out as I was researching for this video that as much as they felt the cattle belonged to them, they also felt that the land belonged, nobody owned the land, which is what also made them sort of move with fluidity, right? Even though that's obviously changing in the modern day. They are also known for their distinctive uh, clothing, which include uh, the cloth here, you know, the typically red cloth, which is checkered, which is known as the shuka, as well as their very elaborate um, jewelry. Uh, some of which is displayed in the image at the bottom here. So a very interesting group uh, that migrated um, in the middle of the 15th, you know, supposedly in the middle of the 15th century from uh, the Lower Nile uh, River, no, no, Lower Nile region to East Africa and populated largely Kenya and Tanzania. So that's one group. A fascinating story, I think we've hinted, we've spoken about, about uh, the gentleman in this picture before, whose name is King Alfonso I. We have spoken about him before, and I, as, I, as I talk a little more about this, maybe he will come back to you. So in the 1480s, um, the Portuguese arrived on the coast of West Central Africa near the mouth of the Congo River. When we spoke about the, the transatlantic slave trade, we saw that the Portuguese had been some of the had been the first uh, to get their process going by setting up a colony in Sao Tome and Principe, which is an island off the west coast of, of Africa, and began enslaving people from Senegambia to go populate that island. So it was a little bit after that time that they came down a little bit to the south along the west coast of Africa and arrived by the Congo River and established diplomatic relationships with the King of Congo who welcomed the foreign connection. Now, the King of Congo at the time, and this is important, was Zinga Kuvu, I believe. Zinga Kuvu, who was the, the first Portuguese, I mean, the first, one of the first Africans to be baptized, I believe he may have been the first to be baptized and, and, and um, you know, at least within the Congo region he was, and he was converted. Now he was the father to, to Alfonso here. Alfonso was also baptized, but I believe it was in 1491 that both, the, both uh, so Alfonso's name is Zinka Mbemba, um, and his father would have been Zinga Nkuvu. And they were, when they were baptized and converted into Catholicism, they became King Joao I for the old Nzinga and King Alfonso I, no, King Joao II for the older, then King Alfonso I for, for, for him here. And as fate would have it, he was, um, you know, Alfonso the, 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 the first went on to be educated in, in Portugal, right? In Portugal, where he came back, and as descriptions have it, he came back more Portuguese than, than Angolan. And when his father died, right, when his father died, his half-brother who had stayed behind in, in, the, in, the, in the Congo was... Um, was 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 a man of the people right he had never converted in fact if anything he denounced this new religion and and um so he was more beloved however because king alfonso the first pictured here was now in cahoots with the portuguese at the backing of the portuguese uh he was able to win that quote-unquote civil war against his brother killed his brother 
uh, whose name was um, Pansu Akitima, and uh, he went on to take the throne. You know, and and his his rule was largely supported in large part by by the Portuguese mercenaries and the and the Portuguese government, if you will. He also opened communication with the Pope in Rome. Within the Congo, Alfonso developed Christianity along the lines of a royal religious cult, increasing his own authority and undermining that of regional religious leaders. Um, so it made him, an, it, this made him a particularly autocratic ruler who now became heavily dependent on the support of the Portuguese. He used Portuguese mercenaries and guns to exert direct control over tribute collection and long distance trade, and he expanded the kingdom by conquest. So this is who he became, right? He would import priests, uh, soldiers, and manufactured goods from the, from the Portuguese. And what was the need for the Portuguese? Well, using his might as the king, he would capture uh, slaves, right, for the Sao Tome and Principa plantations, okay? So he became, so that's what was in it for the Portuguese. They had control. They didn't have to remember that a lot of times these enslavers did not have necessarily military might with them. They needed African authorities to do the bidding for them. So this is where people like King Alfonso would come in handy to capture people. So you, people were being captured and sent to the Sao Tome and Principa plantations. And eventually they were going to it being taken to, to the Americas as well, particularly Brazil. In 1568, a group known as the Jaga people. Now, the, bo the books I was re using in uh, my further research doesn't really pin down on who these Jaga people were, but there were different communities from outside of the Congo, or at least outside of Alfonso's rule. And they came over and invaded the Congo kingdom. Right, invaded the Congo Kingdom in 1568 or 1569. Um, and they quickly overran the kingdom, laying waste the country and forcing the king into exile. Okay, so we're still not sure who these folks were, but this didn't last long because by, 15, six, by 1574, uh, King Alvaro uh, was reinstated, another one from the Congo uh, from the Congo bloodline was reinstated. Uh, with the help of, of Portuguese mercenaries. But after that, his authority was on the decline and, uh, you know, became particularly dependent on the export of captives in exchange for Portuguese military support, which Portuguese military support itself would decline as we went into the 17th century, right? Because the Dutch and other groups had to take over. So without the backing of the, of the Portuguese on the West Coast, his decline, um, the, uh, the, the king's authority was severely on the decline. So that's the Congo kingdom. Another kingdom from within, from around that region was, uh, was, the, was the kingdom of Angola. Right, Angola, of which the word Ngola uh, means king, right? Ngola. So when you say the Ngola of Ndongo, it means the, 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 the king of Ndongo. So if we look at our map here, uh, Congo is, uh, you know, as we can tell, it's, it's, it's up here, right? But this is in, in modern day, uh, this is in modern day maps, right? But this is about the region where the Congo would have been. And 200 miles to the south would have been, uh, would have been, uh, so this is, sorry, this is where, um, where um, the Congo would have been centered at the time and 200 miles to the south would have been where is where, south east a little bit is where Angola would be, right? So that's where, so the idea here was Beginning in 1530, Sao Tome developed as a major transit point for captives being transported across the Atlantic to the plantations in Brazil, right? So as the, as the, as the demand for slaves continued to increase, the Congo was not enough to supply this. So they set up another, another slaving station at Luanda, Luanda, which is the modern day capital of Angola. 
uh, which was 350 kilometers to the south of the Congo River or 200 miles. Um, so, and, 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 and the trade in captives really strengthened the power of the Angola, right? As, as you would continue to do this. Now, this was in large part, so these were slavers. This was not the Portuguese government itself. These were the slavers who were doing this to evade paying taxes and, and Portuguese royal control. So they set up their own station further down. Now in, remember we said that there's that occupation by, or that invasion by the Jaga people in 1564. And this made the, the Portuguese government say, wait a minute, right? Our position in Angola, I mean, in the Congo is precarious. Why don't we move and set up shop in Angola? We've already seen that the Sao Tome enslavers have done that, but the Sao Tome enslavers were doing this in a, again, in a very capricious way, in a, in a clandestine way, in such a way that they did not try to invade Angola, right? They were working with Angola of Ndongo and doing this trade. It wasn't a, a colonial project per se, but when the, when the Portuguese set out to do it, they were there to, to um, when, the, when, the, when, the Portu when the Jaga invaded the Congo, the Portuguese easily dispatched with them. So that made them feel that, you know what? They could take the control of the entire region. So they went down uh, to try conquer the kingdom of Ndongo, right? Which is modern day Angola. And the Portuguese invasion of Angola was defeated by a combination of stiff resistance from the Mbundu people and the tropical diseases that decimated the Portuguese troops. Um, so, and the invasion was pretty much done by the, by the 1580s and the remnants of the Portuguese army settled into the role of regular slave traders. So they tried to colonize, but they were totally restricted. And going forward, uh, uh, you know, even going into the 17th century, persistent Bundu resistance organized by such leaders as Queen Zinga, who is famously pictured here. Um, you know, in, in, in a, I'll put the link to her story here. This is a famous incident in which she went to meet with the, with the Portuguese representative and the Portuguese representative had a chair, uh, you know, and the idea was for her to sit on the floor so she could be at lower footing than him and she had one of her servants uh, bend over and serve as a chest so that she could appear to be on equal footing with the king. So she was, she was boss like that. But, you know, in the 17th century, um, as the Portuguese kept trying to, to come in, uh, the resistance led by her ensured that the Portuguese settlement was confined to Luanda and other coastal enclaves. Uh, so, Portuguese supported slave raids continued, but by mid century they had given up their attempts to conquer the interior. Okay, so the idea here is that the the Portuguese, if they had had their way, they would have conquered the territory um, of of uh, you know the, where modern day Angola is, the Ndongo area. But due to the resistance of people like Queen Zinga, you know, they were unable to do that, right? So they were restricted to, you know, to sort of working just from Luanda and from, from, from the coastal areas here. However, this did not necessarily mean that there was a decline in the, in the, in the enslavement, right? Angola, uh, modern day Angola is one of the places where a lot of enslaved people who, who made it into, into uh, Brazil and the Americas are come from uh, because you know incessant wars in the region provided the Portuguese with all the captives they needed um, and uh, and and so forth. However, the, the 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 Portuguese, you know, because they were now starting to tax the slavers. Uh, led to that led to the slavers starting to sell more to the Dutch, the French, and the English, and, and so forth. Uh, and of which the slavers would would get in return uh, cheap French and English guns, um, and, and so forth. So we say all this to say, this is how the Portuguese at the time 
were sort of pushed out of that trade, right? Um, other principal imports in exchange for captives from Angola were Indian cartons and Brazilian rum. Imports such as these help destroy indigenous African craft and industry. And if you watch my video on the end of the trans on the tra on the end of the transatlantic slave trade, I get into more depth on on why that was. So, within the Angolan interior, various groups were active in the supply of captives for the coastal market. After an initial period of warfare. Uh, the Imbangala people invaded coastal lowlands in the 15th, 70s, and 80s, and many settled down to farming again. Others became regular slave raiding mercenaries for the Portuguese of Luanda, right? So these are the different groups that were that were indeed continuing to feed. Uh, so it was an, it was never just everybody all in on it, but there were definitely groups that were prominent in feeding into the slave trade, right? So that's another important group. Now, to talk about uh, the Changamire Roji of the Zimbabwe Plateau. Uh, this is very interesting because, and I'll have to do a couple of videos to, tell, to talk about how we even get here, but um, a Cliff Notes version of that is, uh, Bantu, commu uh, uh, you know, Bantu people who had migrated all the way to the south um, of Africa in circa 900 uh, CE to maybe 1200 CE had built these large rock settlements in what is now South Africa, but on the border of South Africa and Zimbabwe and, and Botswana today. Uh, this area is known as Mapungubwe, right? You know, and I've spent some time there. It's a very spiritual place just to stand on it and, and so forth. And we'll do a, another video that, that is dedicated to that. Then between, uh, you know, that, that same group or the, 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 that same group or the, the, the descendants thereof would migrate to the north and land up, uh, land in modern day Mashringo in, in Zimbabwe, right? Okay, and there, which on this map would be, so Mapungubwe is over here, right? And they would migrate north and end up uh, hereabouts in this general area here, okay? And between 1250 and 1450, thereabouts, they would build the, the, the largest structures outside of the pyramids in pre-colonial Africa, and this is known as the Great Zimbabwe, right, or Mad Zimbabwe, where the country eventually gets its name, uh, Mad Zimbabwe, which means uh, houses of stone and, and, and so forth. And because of conquest and, and, and a depletion of resources around 1450, or 1420 rather, they uh, an, an elder or uh, one of the higher ups in the region, uh, in, in the kingdom, in the great Zimbabwean kingdom, is sent to the north to try to find more resources and ends up at this place known as Mutapa. And that, that's, his name was Mutota. And between 1420 and right up until the 1700s, the authoritative kingdom of the region was the Mutapa Empire, right? Was the Mutapa Empire, which played a huge role in both the Great Zimbabwe and the Mutapa Empire played a huge role in the uh, transcontinental trade, um, you know, uh, supporting the the, the 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 trade in the Indian Ocean trade, uh, particularly with Kilwa and so forth. And I spoke a little bit about that in my last video on the on the on the on the East African coast. So, but. And you know this this place was was attacked. The the Mutapa Empire had been attacked a few different times, right? Um, including by including by um, once in sixteen twenty three by the Portuguese, if I remember correctly, right? Um, 
and they were able to 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 repel uh, that attack with with some ease because um, with 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 the backing of sorry no the, the, that attack of the, by the Portuguese actually happens before it happens in 1571 when the Portuguese are again trying to conquer this place right they try to 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 convert the 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 Mutapa, which was the title of the king, tried to convert him and he had said no. And when they tried to invade him, actually the Mutapa didn't even have to do their bidding because the Tonga people to the north here actually did the, did the fighting on their behalf and, 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 and were able to defeat the Portuguese and sort of keep them out of the, out of the, out of the territory, out of the, out of the, out of the, the kingdom. In 1623, however, uh, the kingdom was, was the, the, the heyday, if you will. So from 1420, they are founded. Then throughout the 1500s, they are on top. By 1620s, they were on their way down. And a large part of that was a very important attack they faced by the Maravi Empire. The Maravi Empire, who were led by Kalonga. And Maravi, as the name suggests, was... Um, is in modern day Malawi. Uh, and, you know, so Kalonga tried extending his authority south of the Zambezi by invading Mutapa in 1623. And although he was forced to retreat, uh, you know, it was though he was forced to withdraw his army, he still left with a lot of gold. And this was, uh, this played a large part in the decline of that really gave the, the, the Mutapa Empire took a lot of it because of the 1623 attack by the Marawi people. So throughout the 17th century, uh, the Portuguese gained increasing control within the Mutapa Empire. A large part of that was indeed uh, because Mutapa's authority had been weakened by the Marawi invasion and, uh, and, and so forth. And as such, uh, Portuguese settlers who are called Prazeros, um, who I believe I've spoken about again in another video, uh, from the from the Zambezi Valley intervened in the civil war that was happening among among them within the Mutapa Empire in exchange for removal of restrictions on their mining and trading within the empire. So between 1630 and 1670, uh, the Prazeros set up a number of trading fairs and tried forcing the local people to open up new gold mines. However, their violent oppression uh, provoked widespread resistance from the local peasant and population. Rather than work the gold mines, the people fled their villages and sought the protection of the powerful local cattle owners and their private militias. So that's how these private militias developed. And one of the private militias that developed at the time was by, that run by one wealthy cattle owner named Dombo who possessed a private army and acquired the title Changamire, which is a, 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 a title of um, an authoritative title. So it became Changamire Dombo. Um, initially, he had been a herdsman uh, of the Monomutapa Empire, but by 1670s, he was an important power in the northeast of the Plateau region, rivaling actually on par with Monomutapa, then Eventually, uh, by the 1680s, he was the more dominant, um, and he and his highly disciplined and well-trained army were known as the Roji. Now, Roji in in what we call Shona today, or or in the language of the time, the Karanga language, Kuroja is to destroy. So the army were known as the as the destroyers, the plunderers, right? So they were very very efficient in that way, and uh, and in time. This became the title. That's what the people, the empire itself, quote unquote, the empire became known as the as the Roji Empire. So beginning in 1960, in 1680s, Changamire led his army, herds of cattle, an increasing body of dependents in an invasion of the southwest. He defeated the Torwa rulers of uh, Guru Uswa down here and took over the capital here of Dananombe. Right, which is which is around here, so expanding all the way from here to here, so the empire grew pretty big, uh, and 
And also remember the Portuguese had been sneaking into what was the Mutapa Empire or the dying embers thereof in the late 17th century. But Changamere Dombo uh, expelled the Portuguese from their trading fair, fairs in Mutapa and Manika here and, and made his Roji Empire the dominant power of the region. Uh, Mutapa actually, which had been the main one, right, became a minor state in the lowland northeast of, of Zimbabwe and, uh, and so forth. So, so, so that's how this, this grew and the, and the Portuguese were restricted to land holdings and this trading post in those places. Um, so it be from the late six, from 1680 until the 1700s, the Roji Empire is, 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 is at its peak. Then by the, by the time the 1830s come around, um, oh, so I think it's, it's important as well now that we talk about what the power was based on, right? It was based on the discipline and reputation of the Roji regiments, right? Um, it was also based on the allegiance of the different groups who felt uh, they protected them from, from the excesses of the Portuguese who paid tribute. Um, and these different groups were also used to tend and protect the Changamira's huge herds of cattle. Okay. And, uh, you know, like I said, different groups uh, paid tribute, uh, mostly in food, cattle, and skins and so forth and gain trophies such as ivory. So that's where the power was. And the, 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 and also they kept strict control of the, of the, of the golden uh, trade, which helped prevent the Portuguese from regaining access to gold trade in the region. So, but by the end of, by the end of the 18th century, so late 1700s, the gold fields were almost completely worked out. And as the trade declined, um, the power of the Changamira also weakened. At this point, the dynasty suffered a succession dispute that led to a prolonged civil war between 1795 and 1820. Trade virtually ceased and the Roji Empire was seriously weakened. Uh, then at that point, right, as we went into the, into the 19th century, um, what happens? I've spoken about this in, in, a, in, the, in, a, in the subsequent video that focuses on the, on the Fekane and Difakane of, of Southern Africa, where the, 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 the Nguni, based on, on political upheaval in the 1820s in what is now South Africa, Shaka, Zulu, and the like, many different groups are forced to flee. And a couple of the groups that, that, that flee include the Jerengoni, uh, led by Zwangen Daba, right? That passed through the Zimbabwean plateau and eventually landed up in Tanzania. But as they passed through, they also ran havoc, plundered what was uh, what was the dying embers of the the the, the of the of the Roji Empire. Okay, and from that group, even though the the Jerengoni ended up settling in modern day Tanzania, a group of the, uh, a section of that group, which was led by Swazi Queen Nyamazana stayed behind, right? A section of the Ngoni group stayed behind in what is now Zimbabwe and fought against the, the dilapidated Roshi Empire. And actually Queen Nyamazana ends up killing the last Changamire in 1836, right? And to sort of put a to put, put, sort of put a final nail in this coffin, another group also fleeing uh, the Mfekane, or at least migrating from the Mfekane, which were the Ndebele, now led by Mzilikazi, uh, by King Mzilikazi, arrived uh, in 1838, and Mzilikazi would end up marrying Queen Yamazana, sort of consolidating the power, and really reducing what was left of the Roji Empire into a, into a subsidiary of what was now, what, was, what would grow on to become the Ndebele Kingdom going forward. And the Ndebele Kingdom is who, when, um, when British colonialism finally came at the end of the 19th century, that was who they would come in contact with. So that's a little bit about the, about the Roji Empire from, from its founding in the in the 
you know, technically in the 1670s up until the uh, 1830s. What about Southern Africa? What other groups have we seen in Southern Africa? So we've already spoken about, as I was saying, uh, the, the, the Bantu groups that uh, had built Mapungubwe and, and migrated to Mad Zimbabwe. These include the Karanga people. Uh, you know, we've seen the different groups such as the Sena and the likes. I was in the Marawi Empire a little bit to the north, which is in modern day Malawi. We've spoken at length about the Khoisan. Um, so who are some of these other people in Southern Africa? And particularly we're looking at the areas that constitute modern day South Africa and Namibia. So here are some of the people here. You see in the Northwest, Ovambo farmers and Herero cattle herders uh, already occupied uh, the northern half of, of, of Namibia. Then you see um, the Soto Tswana lineage groups which dominated the Kalahari Desert. Um, who else? You know, uh, different Guni speaking groups that were organized into small, many small clan based chiefdoms, you know, across the southeastern world, right? You know, all across this area here. And if, again, if you watch the subsequent videos, you'll see what became of the small clans as they grew into kingdoms. Then you see uh, the Khoisan were mainly along in Namibia and, um, you know, the pastoralists that were mainly found in, in southern Namibia and all over the southwestern capes, a cape interspersed with different hunter-gatherer groups, right? So... That's that's the that's a little bit about who was there. So and this will help inform this next part of, of, of our conversation today. So South and Africa up until the 18th century. We spoke about a little bit about East and Central, so now we're talking about Southern Africa. So, like I said, alongside the, the southwestern in Namibia and the southwestern Cape is where the uh, the Khoisan were. And there were, you know. Numbers have it, and you can never be too dependent on these numbers. There were up to 50,000 uh, Khoisan pastoralists that were living in the Southwest at the time, right? And initially, beginning in the, sixth, in, the, in, in the 16th century, European sailing ships, mainly Dutch and English, began making regular voyages across the southern tip of Africa to trade in India. Southeast Asia and Indonesia, right? And this area is known as the East, that's what they mean when they talk about the East Indies. So the Southwestern Cape of Good Hope was about halfway um, along that long sea voyage. And back then the, it, had, uh, it had become a regular port of call for ships needing to replenish their supplies of fresh water and meat from local Khoisan herdsmen. And initially, the, the, the Khoisan welcomed the traders. Why is that? Well, it was trade, right? Especially because they were able to sell off their own surplus old and sick animals in exchange for things like iron, copper, and beads from the Europeans, right? So there were, there were pastoralists living in a place where they were mostly to themselves, okay? And they were probably in harmony with, uh, with many of the things at the time with the, with the, you know, their cows did not necessarily face too much in the form of natural predators. So they had a lot of surplus. So they were, re they were glad to be able to trade a lot of that. However, this trading soon turned to conflict as the Khoisan started to demand higher prices and the Europeans, of course, turned to raiding, right? Which is that uh, prototypical colonial move. Now the first, so these were just the Europeans were there at the time. The Dutch East India Company led by Jan, Rand, uh, Jan van Riebeck, Jan van Riebeck uh, established shop in 1652, right? when they founded a small permanent settlement in 1652, right? And the idea was to establish monopoly in trading with the, with the Khoisan and hope that this would regular, regularize the meat trade with the Khoisan and so keep prices down. At the same time, this settlement would grow fresh fruit and vegetables for the ships and provide a hospital for six sailors. 
So the idea here was really to, since the Dutch and the English had been moving, uh, had been traveling that, that route, the Dutch wanted to cement themselves as the people of that region, right? So, so as a result, a fortress manned by company soldiers, by company women, the Dutch East Indian Company, was built to protect the settlement from attacks by rival European shipping. Okay. So as soon as that happens, right, again, the, like I said, the Khoisan had initially welcomed the trade in contact, but they quickly regretted it for, as the Dutch East Indian Company began demanding far more cattle than their natural surplus uh, were prepared to sell, as well as um, they, you know, initially they'd been trading in some, they had been getting some pretty good stuff in return, but now they were just getting luxuries such as copper, beads, tobacco, and alcohol, right? Then soon iron was also quickly dropped as a trading item because uh, the Khoisan could make it into spears uh, which they could fight back against uh, the, the Europeans and guns were just never on the table at all as trade. So the idea was really to cement this idea of control of the region. When the Khoisan would not willingly sell their livestock, uh, their cattle were seized, um, often on some flimsy pretext such as theft of some, or theft of some tobacco or something like that. So the, the, the trade really became lopsided such that in 1659, the Khoisan managed to unite. Now, remember, the Khoisan were not an empire like the other ones we've spoken about, right, in the series. Uh, they were more a disjointed group of people, okay? And as such, they, you know, I mean, this is not to, 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 to denigrate the money either. They were just... Other groups are empires and other groups are, they get along well, you know, in, in smaller groups and, and that functions perfectly for, for that group. So that's how the Khoisan operated. And, but in 1659, they were able to organize and, uh, and were actually, you know, successful somewhat, right? However, despite their brave attempts, they quickly learned the limitations of the, of uh, of the uh, of their of their primitive weapons in comparison to to uh, to that to that of the Europeans and were unable to overrun the fortress itself. And after months of stalemate and a complete suspension of trade, the Khoisan alliance fell apart and their leaders were forced to come to terms. Here's how Van Re Jan van Riebeck, who I just spoke about, described how this went, the meeting with him and the Khoisan leaders, All right? They spoke for a long time, and I quote Jan van Riebeck here, they spoke for a long time about our taking every day for our own use more of the land which had belonged to them for all ages and on which they were accustomed to pasture their cattle. They also asked whether if they were to come to Holland they would be permitted to act in a similar manner, saying, it would not matter if you stayed at the fort, but you come into the interior, selecting the best land for yourselves, and never once asking whether we like it or whether it will put us at, to any inconvenience. They, they, they therefore insisted very strenuously that they should again be allowed free access to the pasture. They objected that there was not enough grass for both their cattle and ours. Are we not right, therefore, to prevent you from getting any more cattle? For if you get many cattle, you come and occupy our pasture with them, and then say the land is not wide enough for us both. Who then, with the greatest degree of justice, should give away the natural, should give way the natural honor of the foreign invader? They insisted so much on this point that we told them that they had now lost that land in war and therefore could not expect to get it back. It was our intention to keep it. Wow. Okay, so what struck me most about this passage is how self-aware Jan van Riebeck realized that they were being pricks, for lack of a better term, right? The way he articulated how well the Khoisan articulated their, their concerns here. Objectively, objectively, you, you could tell that the Khoisan were right. And Jan van Riebeck pretty much says, you know what? 
you know, screw it, you know, uh, we won. So all the sense that you make is none of our business. So um, I just, I just find that to be very, uh, to be very uh, striking, really, as a, you know, as we talk about, um, as as we talk about the, the 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 how brash and how you know brutal really the process of colonialism was, and as a result of that, the for the most part the. Um, resistance was reduced to to um, to just cattle raids and so forth, right? So the 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 the, the Khoisan would now just um, raid the cattle of the of of the Dutch, which had which since they had emerged as um, as being far militarily superior, so. So, but as the Dutch settled there, throughout the 1680s and 90s, they began to promote um, migration. White, uh, so this is that way they could grow the so the the white population. So initially, it had been a few, a couple dozen people, but by the 1680s and 1690s, that population, white population, was up to a thousand, was up to a thousand. Then, as well, beginning. Almost immediately, I think the following year uh, after they settled, they settled uh, in 1652 with Jan van Riebeck. In 1653, that following year, you saw the uh, the first the first uh, slave, if you will, uh, arrived uh, from what is uh, Dutch East Indies at the time, which is uh, uh, Indonesia today. And his name was Abraham van Batavia, right? And he became, he was the first one, but uh, in 1653. Then the following year, um, uh, the following year, uh, a ship was sent out via Mauritius to Madagascar to capture more slaves. And eventually uh, at the peak, so at the peak, beginning in 1658, I believe, uh, 10 more slaves arrived, so there were now 11 enslaved people in the region, right? Um, and, you know, so it would go from then on um, as more and more people began to be brought in uh, as well as slaves. Such so that, you know, the, the main source of this, of, of this uh, you know, the, the reason for this was the, the settlers, the Dutch settlers had now started taking land, right? And they, this is where the term Boers, which is synonymous with the, with the Dutch descendant population of South Africa or the Africanas uh, today is the Boers. And the Boers, uh, it means farmer, right? So these folks were known as farmers and began to, and especially when they became the Trek Boers, uh, Trek Boers means the traveling farmers, right? So they would go more inland and claim these large hectares, uh, these large farms, 25 hectares and so forth, and mainly in, in places like Stellenbosch, where the, the weather is fantastic, you know, for, for vineyards and, and so forth, like that, these agricultural valleys. And so the, the labor from that is the, 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 those enslaved people were coming to work in these places, and they came from places like uh, Madagascar, like I said already, Mozambique, Indonesia, uh, a few came from from Angola as well, as uh, as ships would be coming from the west coast. Sometimes they would bring some people who were also enslaved in 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 in, in what is you know the other time it was just the Cape Colony, right? Uh, and there would be two hundred to three hundred a year uh, that would come, such that by eighteen hundred they numbered twenty five thousand enslaved people right as opposed to 21,000 white people where they so they they actually out, out they actually um you know outpopulated if you will the outnumbered the, the 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 Europeans at that point um so what you find is um 
as all this is happening, the as as the track as the as the Boers expand their territory, they are they are eating into more of of the Khoisan territory as well, right? And in response to this, the Khoisan, uh, you know, they try to resist, you know, and they their resistance uh, usually followed either direct military resistance, withdrawal into the interior, or acceptance of uh, of subservient position within the Boer society. So, you know, they were being pushed, you know, remember we said they were mainly by the coast and now they were being pushed more inland, okay? Um, so, you know, from the, and, and, and by 1713, really, the Khoisan were almost entirely wiped out be, by way of uh, the boss superior weaponry of horse and gun. Uh, you know, they also were subject to a series of smallpox epidemics that were brought uh, to the Cape by European ships, which is not unlike what happened with the, with the Native American population in, in the US of A, right? So, and that, that would largely happen in 1713. And like I said, those were the main ways in which they, they, they resisted. Um, you know, mainly like they tried military resistance, but again, they, 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 were, they were losing that fight uh, nine times, nine point five times out of ten, really. Then they also withdrew into the interior, uh, beyond the boundaries of the expanding European colony. Um, but even then, even as they did that, the the Europeans continued to expand and would eventually catch up, right? So, um, and and but but also, if some of them withdrew far enough, and among these groups were the likes of the Greca and the Kora, which are like several groups of the Khoisan, were able to retain some degree of independence until much later, okay? Um, but gradually, during the course of the 18th century, more and more Khoisan resigned themselves to their laws of economic and political independence. By agreeing to, to work for the Boers, especially as herdsmen and hunters, they retained some access to land Although paid very little, if anything, for their labor, they were usually allowed to keep a few animals of their own. But with the loss of Khoisan independence, when the loss of their cultural roots and even their languages, they adopted the clothing, Dutch language, and other cultural trappings of their masters, quote unquote. Many served alongside the Boers um, in, in commando raids against other Khoisan and, and in due course. Um, against the against the Tosa people as well. So that's a little bit about about the conquest, the arrival of the Dutch, and the eventual conquest of the um, the Khoisan people who who lived over there, who were either you know many of them were wiped away by death. Those who were still there were pushed more inland from the Cape of Southern Af of South Africa inland, but many of them actually ended up just working as servants in several roles to the Dutch. So I want to talk about the, the Cape colored real quick, but let me see here. Okay, good. So I to make sure that I do talk about the frontier wars before we're done. So an interesting group that develops out of this is known as the Cape colored, right? Which uh, po one popular picture from back in the day is here. And the Cape Colored is a racial dem demarcation, which, uh, which is uh, sizable in South Africa today. But this is a, really a catch-all term for, um, for, for the following groups, right? Um, the Khoisan, you know, who were lumped together with the freed slaves. Remember we said the slaves were coming from Madagascar, Mozambique, Indonesia, and so forth and other people of mixed Khoi, uh, slave and European ancestry. Uh, it was during the 19th century that white colonists began referring to the whole Dutch speaking Khoisan, freed slave and mixed race population as Cape Colored. So when you, if you were to go to Cape Town, that population is still large today. And it is, uh, again, as that suggests, you know, on one level, you might just think it's mixed people, right? The Europeans and the Africans, but because of the people who were being brought, who, who were Malay 
and Asian were being brought into the mix as well. Bear in mind that the Khoisan are a different ethnic group, right? Are essentially a different, if you want to talk about racial classification as being a thing, they're actually different from the Bantu people, right? Of which the, the Tosa people and the Nguni peoples are, are Bantu. So the mix is very interesting, right? For it to all constitute what we call uh, the Cape color, because you might see somebody who is pretty definitively of, uh, of Southeast Asian ancestry, right? Somebody who's, who's pretty Indian, you know, <laughs> if, if, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, being among the, the Cape colored. Then you might see somebody who is uh, who has strong Khoisan features uh, or Bantu features or pretty white, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, being, so the Cape Colors is sort of a catch all population for that. And it's a very interesting one that, um, that originates from the, the mixing that we've just spoken about at the, you know, in the, in this season, in, in, in this, in this, uh, in the past couple uh, minutes. Then finally today, I'll talk about, I'll introduce the frontier wars. So as the track boards continue to expand, they end up um, as they advanced east in, you know, they first they arrived on the southwest coast where they encountered the Khoisan, but as they in, advanced eastward, they, they reached the westernmost territory of the Tosa by the 1760s. Now, you know, the Tosa, again, are a different group from the Khoisan, right? The, the Khoisan are the Khoi, uh, but the Tosa are Nguni, which is a subset of the Bantu population, right? So, so throughout the 18th century, contact between the, the colonists and the, and the Nguni had been, had been building up. But in the beginning, the Tosas were not faced as well by these uh, white settlers. They did not view their presence uh, with any alarm. They saw the white colonists as fellow pastoralists who, like the Khoisan, could in due course be absorbed into an expanded Tosa society. So the Tosa society had absorbed a lot of Khoisan people, which is where even the click, when I say Tosa, it, it's, a, it's something that is uh, brought in from the, from the clicks of the Khoisan language, right? Uh, and, um, and, and, and it, you know, it's something that really differentiates the Tosa language from say the Zulu language, which is very similar, but, uh, you know. But, uh, as time went on, um, one of the earliest points of direct contact between white colonists and Tosa in 1702 was tainted with violence as a party of 45 um, Boers uh, raided um, and attacked a group of Tosas and captured several thousand Khoisan sheep and cattle. Uh, but conflict really, you know, to say conflict was inevitable is a lie because uh, for the most part, toward the 18th century, a few notable Trek Boer individuals blended into Tosa society, marrying Tosa wives. Uh, you know, some of them even married a few wives, practicing polygamy like the Tosas did, and established important and hunting and trading connections between Tosas and the colony. The real conflict doesn't really start until the 1770s, as the Trek Boers settlers start to come into the land known as the Zurveld, um, you know, which uh, coincided with the period of, of Tosa, the Tosas at the point were also expanding to the west and they came to a head. And this would result in a series of three wars, right? Uh, beginning in 1779 um, and um, and so forth, and um, and the third one being in 1803, right? And the wars, you know, they were not decisive, right? In earlier conflict with Khoisan herders, the Boers had been able to take advantage of a general lack of unity and the relatively small size of most Khoisan clans. Um, so they'd had that momentum from, from conquering the Khoisan, which we described earlier. The Tosa, by contrast, at a much larger population with a more close-knit social organization. 
Although often split by internal political disputes, the Tosa showed a remarkable degree of unity and determination when their territory was threatened, right? So we ride together when things go bad. We can fight among ourselves as brothers. As such, they presented the colonists with a formidable opposition, which track war commanders alone were unable to overcome. So between 1779 and 1803, we see the three front, the first three frontier wars, one, two, and three, and they were undecisive, uh, inco inclu inconclusive affairs, which left uh, the Tosa and their co and their and their and their Khoisan allies in possession of most of that territory, right? So they retained the Tosa retained a majority of that land. And when you watch the other video, which I did on the Fekane, you will see how the final frontier wars, the two final frontier wars, uh, no Star Wars reference. The Star Wars or Star Trek, anyway, one of those. Uh, you will see how they ended. So I will link that in the description below. So I believe that's it for, for our lesson today. The key takeaways, what are the Maasai known for, right? What are some of the things that the Maasai are known for? Uh, talk a little bit about the Congo-Portuguese relationship, which West Central countries supplied, modern day countries supplied a large number of slaves and who, uh, an example of somebody from there who led the anti-colonial resistance. What was the Zimbabwean empire that succeeded the Mutapa? Who were the first white people to settle in South, modern day South Africa at the time, which was the Cape Colony? What groups did they encounter and what were the relationships? Who was enslaved in South Africa? And what were the results of the frontier wars? So at least the first three frontier wars, right? So yeah, um, that's our lesson for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I will look forward to meeting with you soon. We should be having a couple other exciting videos coming up. So thank you uh, for staying tuned. And if you haven't already, make sure you, you, you subscribe to the channel so you stay tuned as we put out more material. And tell somebody to tell somebody to tell somebody, man. Uh, I'm trying to grow this channel as fast as I can and uh, continue to get the encouragement to, to keep doing these videos. Thank you all so much, and I'll see you next time. One.